He suggested the change in the footnote. He made a total, if I average about 15 to 20 uh, changes per page. If you multiply 15 or 20 times the 1434 pages, you get 20 to 30 thousand changes in the Hebrew Masoretic text. Uh, he was an apostate modernist. And we can understand how they despise the words of God. In, in the book of Romans, remember, it's unto the Jews that God committed the oracles of God. Now they've updated this Kittle Bible. It's still called Biblia Hebraica. Or the Hebrew Bible. Now it's called Stuttgartensia. Because it was printed in Stuttgart, Germany. It's printed by the World Bible Society. 1967-1977. The same is true in this Bible. It follows the Biblia break of Rudolf Kittel. Puts the Hebrew Masoretic text up on top. And then it puts the footnotes on the bottom. Well, they want to change these texts. The old uh, Kittle Bible was 1,434 pages. The new Stuttgartensia Bible is 1,574 pages. All right. There's 140 pages more in this new Bible. It's about 10% more pages. I will still estimate some 20 to 30,000 changes from the Hebrew text. There are probably more because it's a longer book. Then in our country, the so-called evangelicals printed the Hebrew Bible. They are in the new evangelical camp, published by Zondervan Publishing. Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's in about four or five volumes, the Old Testament interlinear. It's got the New International Version in the, inter in the sides of this translation. It's edited by John Kohlenberger. They have done in this version what the modernists and apostates never did. They don't worry about the footnotes in changing God's words. Though they have footnotes. When they want to change the text, they change it right up in here in the Hebrew. Even the apostate uh, Rudolf Kittle would never do that. No Jew would dare touch the Masoretic text. They have footnotes, yes, but they never touch the text. But anytime these new evangelicals want to change God's word, they change it. For instance, in 
Genesis chapter 4. If you turn to your Bibles, please. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8. Would someone read that, please, in our King James Version? There are King James Version. When you read that, you have to And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass. Come on, I don't see me. When Cain saw that Abel was not looking at him, he said, Where is Abel? And he said, 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 He Thank you, sir. Would you read just the first portion again, please? Abel, okay. Now, the particular interlinear version here, put out by Sanderman, adds this phrase after the word uh, Abel. They say, let's go out to the field. It's not in the Hebrew text. And yet they change it right in their Hebrew text. They make up their own Hebrew. Because they believe that's the genuine reading. Now let's take a look at our 11 changes from the Masoretic Hebrew text found in the New International Version. And, and these are also found in the New English Bible, many of them. Also many of them found in the New American Standard Version. And some of the footnotes are even found in the New King James Version. And though the New King James does not change the text up here, in the footnotes they suggest these very changes. Change number one from the Hebrew Masoretic text. The Septuagint or the LXX. The Septuagint or the 70. This is the Greek Old Testament translation. And just because the copies that they have are a little older than the Hebrew copies that they have, they therefore think the readings in the Septuagint or the Greek Old Testament, they think they're better than the Hebrew Old Testament. The LXX or the Septuagint Greek Old Testament reads like the Living Bible translation. In many places of its text, the Greek translation is not faithful to the Hebrew at all. In many places, it is sloppily done. And in many places, there are gaps where they don't even have the verses. God never told the, the Greeks to preserve his word. God put it in the hands of his people Israel. And it's preserved in his Hebrew text. Not the Greek translation of it. The second change from the Hebrew. They use conjecture. Conjecture, which is mean guesswork. Okay. Anytime they think there ought to be a change, 
They say, I think it's this way. Let's try it. Now, in the apostate Kittle Hebrew Old Testament Bible, every once in a while you come along in the footnote with an L. And that L just means in Latin, legendum. And that means which read. It means I don't have any Hebrew text. I have no Greek text that reads this way. I have no other language text of any kind that reads this way. It just means I, Rudolf Kittle, think it ought to be this way. And I'll add to the word if I want. I'll, and I'll add to the scriptures if I wish. And I'll change what's in the text if I want to. This conjecture is blasphemy. God pronounces a curse for changing his word. The third change in the New International Version from the Hebrew. Sometimes they use the Syriac language, the Syriac language. That's one of the ancient versions, the ancient translation. We don't want the Syriac, we want the Hebrew Masoretic traditional text. The fourth change in the New International Version from the Hebrew. The Latin Vulgate. That's a translation in Latin of the Hebrew Bible. God never told the Latin people to preserve his word in the Old Testament. You remember all the details of how to preserve those words in the Hebrew like yes. last night? Do you remember the specific care that God required of his words? The Latin Vulgate has no care like that. And we must reject it as a substitute for the Hebrew text. The fifth thing that is changed from the Hebrew in the New International Version. The Dead Sea Scrolls are no substitute for the Hebrew text. The Dead Sea Scrolls were just a book of Isaiah. And sometimes they change the Hebrew in our Bible to conform to that book. We visited the Qumran caves, Mrs. Wade and I, several summers ago. They showed us facsimiles of these Dead Sea Scrolls. These, these Jews in the early times took some of the scrolls of Hebrew and went over to a big settlement and stayed there. But God's holy Hebrew scrolls stayed in the temple where it belonged. And though the Dead Sea Scrolls are almost exactly as a Masoretic text, and, but if there's a difference, we must follow the Hebrew 
Masoretic text, not the Dead Sea Scrolls. The sixth change in the old Hebrew text from the new in the new international version is Aquila. Aquila had a Greek Old Testament translation that sometimes they quote. But this is never to be taken in favor instead of the Masoretic Hebrew text. Let me list the other seven, or from seven to eleven, very quickly. The Samaritan Pentateuch sometimes is used as a substitute for Hebrew. That's the first five books that were translated uh, early, but not in the Hebrew Bible as we have it. Sometimes they put Jerome and quote Jerome as the Bible instead of the Masoretic text. Ninth, sometimes they quote the historian Josephus, who isn't it wasn't even a Bible writer. In the tenth place, sometimes they have an ancient Hebrew scribal tradition. We don't, want, we don't want these scribal traditions, we want the words of Hebrew in the Old Testament. Yet all ten of the above are used in the New International Version from time to time. Now my question is this. If Rudolf Kittel and his Bibi Hebraica, and if the World Bible Society and their Bibi Hebraica Stuttgartensia that has recently come off the press, and if Sondervan's interlinear Hebrew, make all these changes in our Hebrew text. Some of them up to 20 to 30,000 changes. Where will they stop? Where's the end of it? Where are the borders of it? There's nothing to stop these men. That's why I say hold the line in the Masoretic traditional Hebrew text. Which was there in the Lord Jesus' day. Preserved for 1,500 years from Moses to Jesus. In which I believe God has preserved from 1,500 years from Jesus to the invention of the printing press. So let's be done with these Bibles that use other than the Masoretic Hebrew Old Testament. Now let's take a look at the New Testament manuscripts. That we have. There was a man by the name of Kurt Allen, A L A N D. He's a German scholar. He's an unbelieving apostate. He works in Munster, Germany. And he's classified the various uh, Greek manuscripts that we have in our possession today. Back in 1967, he gave certain estimates of what we have. God has preserved tremendous amounts of our New Testament. Though the Old Testament Hebrew has maybe 1,700 manuscripts, the New Testament Greek has 5,200 manuscripts. 
church fathers, as we call them. The church fathers were early preachers and pastors and bishops in the Roman church and the Greek church. And we Baptists don't agree with their theology anyway. But they wrote letters to the various churches all over the, the then known world. And when a famous church father wrote a letter to the churches that he was uh, over, sometimes he quoted some verses of scripture. Sometimes he just made an allusion to a verse of scripture. So that Dean John William Burgon looked at these quotations. Dean Burgon was opposed to Westcott and Hort, who lived at the same time in England. He lived in the 1800s. And Westcott and Hort lived in the 1800s. Westcott and Hort did not like Dean Burgon's method of his method of textual criticism. They did not like it. Westcott and Hort, I believe, were theological heretics. I've written a short pamphlet here called The Heresies, The Theological Heresies of Westcott and Hort. I took five of their books and looked at them. And I quoted maybe 125 different quotations. I organized the quotations on all the theological points that we mentioned last evening. The heresies in bibliology or the study of the Bible. The heresies in theology proper or the Trinity. The heresies in the areas of anthropology and homartiology. That means the doctrine of man and the doctrine of sin. The heresies of the doctrine of Satanology. And the heresies in ecclesiology of the church. The heresies in pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The heresies in the area of eschatology or last things, prophecy. The heresies in regard to soteriology or the doctrine of salvation. And a huge section on their theological heresies on the person and work of Christ in Christology. And I believe these theological apostates and heretics Bishop Westcott and Anthony Hort of the Anglican Church in the 1800s were the responsible people for changing the textual basis of our New Testament. The whole intellectual thinking world followed them like puppy dogs. Oh, 
Corinthians. I believe their unbelief influenced their beliefs on what was the text of Scripture. I was mentioning Dean Bergon's use of the church fathers. He used the church fathers when they quoted Scripture. In the British Museum in, in London today, there are 16 huge folio volumes. They have 86,489 quotations from the Church Fathers. These were researched by Dean Burgon from the Church Fathers' writings. There were a hundred Church Fathers who lived before the oldest manuscripts. They lived from 100 to 300 A.D. They had a Bible in their hand when they quoted it. And church father after church father quoted many of these verses that they've thrown out of their Bibles in these new Bibles. We have republished five of Dean Burgon's books. The Bible for today has some 2,000 pages of Burgon. I couldn't bring all the books by Dean Burgon. I brought one called Revision Revised. It's never been answered, I believe. It has three divisions. It is a, first of all, the analysis of the English Revised Version of 1881, how bad it was compared to the King James Version. Then Dean Bergen, in a scholarly way, analyzed and criticized the Greek text of, the, of uh, Westcott and Horror. In the third place, Dean Bergen took on the false theory behind the Greek text. used some 200 more church fathers in addition to these first hundred. These lived between 300 and 600 A.D. AD. There were five of the oldest manuscripts that were written right during that time of those church fathers. Let me just give you an example, for instance. The last 12 verses of Mark. The last 12 verses of Mark. Acts 6, uh, Mark 16, uh, 9 to 20. You'll find those are bracketed by most modern translations. Sometimes they're separated by a black line. There's a footnote saying we don't think these verses are genuine. One of the verses they would take out of your hands is Mark 16, 15. 
This is the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, Dean Burgon has these quotations from church fathers. A hundred of them lived from 100 to 300 A.D. He quotes 10 or 12 of these church fathers, as I recall. In a book that he's called The Last 12 Verses of Mark.
time to quote the, the qualifications. Of the translators of the King James Version. And also we hope to look at the dynamic equivalency curse. Which is the method of translation on just about all these new modern versions. Including your Basa translation. Your Basa translation is based on the false Westcott and Hort Greek text. I looked at a few verses and I believe it's dynamic equivalency as well. It's put out by the American Bible Society. And its pictures are patterned after today's English version. Which is the good news for modern man. I realize you don't have any other one, I guess, at this time. You've got to take what you have. But if I can get together with uh, Brother Duo and Brother Joab, we'll get you a few verses and a few changes in your Basa Bible that are wrong changes. Turn it back over to Brother Joab for closing. Okay, come Okay, then you are here. 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 Okay, then you are here.